At the same time that I was developing Clue, and Bill and Mary were working on Alphard, um, Alan Kay and um, Adele Goldberg were working on uh, small talk and uh, on the West Coast. And although it may seem a little strange these days, in those days it was a long way from the East Coast to the West Coast. And of course we had no conference calls in those days too. So that whole business about object-oriented programming was developing on the West Coast and on the East Coast we were mostly working on data abstraction. And the two worlds were kind of separated. So I knew the name, but we didn't run into each other at conferences, and uh, that was, there wasn't much cross-talk going on. In the 1980s, I was asked to give a keynote at Uppsala, which I think had, it was maybe the second Uppsala. It hadn't been in existence very long. And uh, so I decided that this was a good opportunity to learn about what was going on in object-oriented languages. And so I started reading all the papers, and I discovered that hierarchy was being used for two different purposes. One was simply inheritance. So I have a class that implements something, I can build a subclass, I can borrow all that implementation, change it however I want, add a few extra methods, uh, change the representation. Whatever I want to do, I just sort of borrow the code and keep working on it. The other way it was being used, though, was for type hierarchy. So the idea was that the superclass would define a supertype, and then the subclass would extend this to become a subtype. And I thought this idea of type hierarchy was very interesting, but I also felt that they didn't understand it very well. And I remember reading papers in which it was clear they were very confused about it, because one in particular that I remember said that a stack and a queue were both subtypes of one another. And uh, this is clearly not true because if you wrote a program that expected a stack and you got a queue instead, you would be very surprised by its behavior. The difference between LIFO and FIFO is a big deal. And this led me to start thinking about what does it really mean to have a type, a supertype and a subtype. And I came up with a rule, an informal rule, which I presented in my keynote at Uppsala, uh, which simply said that a Subtype should behave like a supertype as far as you can tell by using the supertype methods. So it wasn't that it couldn't behave differently. It's just that as long as you limited your interaction with its objects to the supertype methods, you would get the behavior you expected. And um, this was an informal definition, just given sort of based on intuition. It's intuitively right in some sense. You can see how you understand the supertype, you write some code in terms of the supertype, whatever object you get should be behave the way you expect. Otherwise, how can you do this independent reasoning about behavior? Um, later on, uh, Jeanette Wing, who actually had been my master's student, I think, and then John Guttag's PhD student, uh, approached me and said, why don't we try to figure out precisely what this means? And so we worked together on this in some papers that got published a bit later. Um, and meanwhile, I was working on distributed computing. I was particularly you know, interested in view stamp replication and some of the other work that was going on in my group at the time. Uh, and I wasn't really thinking about this until sometime in the 90s when I got an email from someone who said, can you tell me if this is the correct meaning of the Liskov substitution principle? So that was the first time uh, I had any idea <laughs> that there was such a thing, that they had, this name had developed. Uh, technically, it's called behavioral subtyping. You know, it says subtypes behave like supertypes. So I just thought that was very amusing. I discovered there were uh, lots and lots of people on the internet having arguments about what the Liskov substitution principle meant. So it was nice to have something that had an impact like that. <laughs>